I'm Ellie Pritchett. I'm, uh, I work in editorial at Vintage Books, where we have the pleasure of publishing Lolita in the Afterlife, an anthology edited by Jenny Minton Quigley, who's on Zoom with me today. So uh, Jenny, so you have a unique personal history with uh, this famous novel Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. Could you tell me a little bit about this connection? I would love to, Ellie. Um, my father, Walter Minton, published the first American edition of Lolita in 1958 in August at G.P. Putnam Sons. Nabokov had completed the novel in 1954, but couldn't find an American publisher who was willing to take it on until um, Walter went and found him in Ithaca at Cornell in 1957. At this point, um, five publishers had rejected the novel. An editor at Viking had claimed um, we would all go to jail if this thing were published. Um, and he wasn't joking, not really. Um, here in America, the McCarthy era was winding down and many publishers and writers had recently been prosecuted. Um, and publishing Lolita was a radical act then, and I think it would still be a radical act to publish Lolita today. So what happened in 1958 when Lolita was published in the US? Um, it became an instant bestseller. Um, it was fueled by outraged reviews such as Orville Prescott, who wrote in the New York Times um, that Lolita was repulsive, high, highbrow pornography. Um, my, my father ran ads that said, read Lolita for yourself and, and discover what everybody's talking about. He loved the controversy um, afterwards when it was published in other countries um, and banned. Um, Walter publicized the bans in order to refuel orders as well. Um, I grew up hearing my mother tell the story of my father boarding a DC-3 airliner in the middle of a storm. Um, it had been grounded for three days and there was finally a lull in the storm and he took off and flew to Ithaca, New York um, and negotiated a deal with the Nabokovs. And, and the story was told to me with the drama and the romance and the mystery of like Casablanca or something. Um, <laughs> it was how my father was able to, you know, pry the copyright away from Maurice Gerodius, the publisher at Olympia Press. Um, and he, he did this by offering both parties um, substantial royalties um, and didn't share with either one exactly how much the other was getting. So how do you think that Lolita is read now? Like, would it still be published today? Like, it, I feel like it is a question that's like more urgent than ever now, like following Me Too and, and, and following, you know, everything else that's going on in the news, like every day. Um, well, yes, it is in the news every day. And this summer we had this funny thing happen where um, there was an outpouring of anger, I guess, um, that greeted this 21 year old um, singer songwriter that my boys, uh, my sons follow um, named Madison Beer. And she has millions of followers. And on tw Twitter, she tweeted that um, Lolita was her favorite book and that she definitely romanticized the storyline. And suddenly, you know, people were coming out of the woodwork to attack her and say it was time to cancel her, um, cancel Madison Beer. How could she romanticize Lolita? Um, and my teenage sons were so interested. They said, oh, this is the book you've been working on, you know, reading and working on. And, and this is the book that grandpa um, published. Um, and after Madison had apologized profusely and the outrage had finally subsided, um, Pop Dust po posted a headline and they said um, something like, maybe, um, maybe cancel Lolita instead of canceling Madison Beer. Um, and they said that it's not often that a 65 year old, that 65 year old literature becomes the center of online controversy and that maybe it should happen more. And I guess that to me is the um, most amazing thing about Lolita is that um, still today, it's a topic of heated discussion everywhere. Um, and it makes you wanna know why. Right. So when you were looking for contributors and reaching out to writers to see what they had to say about this, since so many people have something to say, like, how did you choose people to ask? 
Um, I, I was looking for a diverse group of writers. I, I was looking for a di diversity of thought and for writers um, who would be interested in different topics about Lolita so that people weren't all writing the same essay. Um, I was looking for renowned writers who were popular, whose opinions um, readers would be interested in. Um, I was looking for both Nabokov experts, um, writers like Mary Gateskill and Ian Frazier and Lila Azam Zangane, who have um, read Nabokov their whole lives, and then writers who were coming to Lolita for the first time, like Andre de Boos. And everyone I asked said yes. It was so charmed in, in that way. I, one of the things that I really love about this book is how different all of the essays are. So there's, you know, Emily Mortimer, who's, you know, an actor and a director, and she's writing that artists often at its best when it's offensive and she has opinions about that and and Roxane Gay has opinions about how how things that you know are horrible and ugly can be written in a way that makes them beautiful and how that changes you know how you understand them and 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 one of the things that I really love also is that you know Mary Gateskill is here and she's rethinking thoughts that she had before you know in the public sphere about Lolita and and Victor Laval is thinking that you know it's a horror novel and there are all of these things sort of rolled up so could you tell me a little more about like other essays in the collection yes yes um Victor's is amazing Lolita is horror and then there's Laura Lipman who writes about Lolita as a mystery you know we all forget that it actually is a, the, a mystery um novel um, Lolita is in the past. Ian Fraser journeys back to St. Petersburg, where Nabokov was born in his research on, on Lolita. Sloan Crosley gives a brilliant expose of um, what popular culture has done to poor Dolores, you know, um, sort of sex sexualizing her and aging her up, and the, both the movies, the posters, some of the music that's come out. Um, Sloan really gets to the bottom of it. Um, Robin Given um, gives a recollection of the baby doll dresses, the Peter Pan collars, some of the Lolita fashion, the short skater skirts. Um, that started in Japan um, as pop culture. I recently saw it on Animal Crossing, this Nintendo game that my kids play. They have Lolita fashion. Anyway, it never spoke to her as a young girl, um, as a black young girl, Robin Given, um, and she explores that and what the fashion represented. Um, Alex Chi, he writes a diary style essay of how Lolita has stuck to him his whole life in these unexpected and very uncomfortable ways. Um, Susan Choi uh, writes about how um, mesmerized and enthralled she was rereading Lolita recently, that she stepped onto a train reading the book and left her backpack um, with her wallet and, and, right? and, her, and her cell phone, everything behind. You know, that's what this novel does to you or right. to her. Um, and Cheryl Strade's um, Dear Sugar Letter is fabulous because we finally get to hear Lolita's voice you know, writing her own letter, mm -hmm. telling her own story over the years. And, um, and Zainab Salbi, she is um, an international women's rights activist and she writes this very eye-opening piece about the current situation of Lolita aged girls in Iraq. And this is just, you know, the ones that are coming on the top of my head, there's many more. So how did Lolita fare like internationally in Europe or elsewhere? Like were publishers more receptive there or, or what? Um, so the Olympia Press published the very first edition of Lolita in France in 1955. It was in English as part of its Traveler's Companion series. Um, my father then published Lolita in America, and he helped Vladimir and Vera uh, negotiate contracts with publishers all over the world. Um, Le Monde recommends Lolita in its 100 books of the century. It's included in Volkloven. Uh, world Library, all over the world, the discussion has been building um, as to how we should read it today. Tobias Retwa, a reporter at the Frankfurter Allgemeine, wrote to my father in 2018 before the Frankfurt Book Fair um, that he was writing a cover story on how to read Lolita in Me Too. And Dan Franklin, um, an English publisher at Cape, he gave an interview to The Spectator. Um, last year that was picked up by The Guardian and said that he would not publish Lolita today. Mm -hmm. um, in the past um, year, there have been articles in The Hindu, in El Pais, in Vogue Paris. Um, people are all talking about Lolita. 
So what do you, just finally, what do you hope that readers will take away from Lolita in the afterlife? Um, I think that losing good writers because of business is one thing, but losing good writers to censorship is another. Um, for decades, my father, who recently passed away a few months ago, um, for decades, he fought with relish for the rights of readers to read books like Lolita, um, books that someone else would rather they not read. Um, and times have changed, and yet they haven't. Um, not really, if you Google cancel culture, if you Google Lolita and Madison Beer. Um, and I hope that this book that we've created will become an enduring roadmap of how we think and talk about Lolita, um, a novel that certainly isn't going anywhere. Well, I have really enjoyed working with you on this book, and I'm really looking forward to bringing it to new readers who hopefully will enjoy it as much as we have at Vintage. So thank you for talking to me about it today. Oh, thank you, Ellie. You're the best. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.